Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. And we are studying Zechariah today, a new vision of Zechariah. It is the vision of the flying scroll. And not squirrel, flying scroll. And so let me ask you a question. If Lyndon in the barn has this big chain hanging from the rafters, and it's connected somehow or another to the bottom of the big lawnmower. And then he has this, has this uh, come a come along, which is a jack, right? No, that's a come Whatever. Uh, it, you do something to it and, it, and it pulls up the lawnmower. But it's on a chain. And so that chain has... I don't know how many links, but I asked him this morning, how many links have to break before that lawnmower falls? One. How many? One. one. Yeah. Just one link. So then I hear Pastor McNabb sometimes talking about driving his motorcycle and the speed limit maybe 60 miles an hour. Does he follow the 60 miles an hour? He's never said he doesn't, but what does he intimate? He that probably he exceeds it just a bit. <laughs> so if the policeman stopped him and said, you're going too fast, and Pastor McNabb says, oh, but wait a minute. I, I follow all the income tax laws, every one of them. <laughs> And furthermore, I have never stolen from my neighbor. Does the policeman care? No. no. Because he broke that law, therefore he is a lawbreaker. So what does that have to do with what we're studying today? We need to pray for pastor. We need to pray for pastor <laughs> and hope he wears his helmet. That's right. And furthermore, we need to pray for Lyndon's come along. Come along? Yeah. Why in the world is it called that? Because it's coming to you. Come, come along. Come along. All right. So we're going to read about a flying scroll today. And it has commandments on it. And James 2.10 says that if we follow all the commandments and break just one, just one, of all of the commandments, we are what? Guilty. Guilty of all of them. So the scriptures tell us that all of us have broken at least one. We've all sinned. We've come short of that standard that God has set for us. And we're going to learn today that when we break just one, we're guilty. We're guilty. We're a lawbreaker. We can no longer stand before God whole and pure. And um, that's kind of hard on all of us, isn't it? So we're going to find a little bit more about that today. And if you would, where is this? There we go. So there's the flying scroll. The scroll represents the Bible in this vision. And we know that the scroll, the Bible, is also known as what? The good book. I'm going to show you a Bible that was not a good book. But the Bible is often called the good book. We also know it as what? The Word of God. The Word of God. We know it as the holy. holy book. That's right. And it's the first book to ever be printed by the Gutenberg Press. Did you know that? Mm -hmm. And Gutenberg was in the 1500s. He invented the printing press. And the first book he printed was the Bible. And in the last several, um, last hundred years or so, it is the most widely sold book in the world. In fact, it's the most widely sold, and the second most widely sold book is Mao Zedong, used to be the emperor of China, and he wrote a book on communism. And you ought to read some of his quotes. They're quite frightening. In fact, you read some of his quotes, and you'll find that we're, being, we're hearing them being said in our own nation today. So you might want to look up some of his famous quotes, Mao Zedong. And Harry Potter comes in third to the Bible. 
So have you ever heard of the Wicked Bible? We know our Bible is the good book. Have you ever heard of the Wicked Bible? Well, if you look at your newsletter, you look at the very bottom, you'll see the Wicked Bible. <clears throat> and uh, Rodney, if you would, just turn the lights back off, Cindy, so people can see this. This is the title page of the Wicked Bible. It was printed in 1631. Last week, we learned about King Charles I and the Crooked Man. Remember, we read, studied that. Well, th this is King Charles I again, and he commissioned <coughs> these printers to print ten, a thousand Bibles. And uh, so it's called the New, the, uh, what's it called? The New, the New Testament of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Somewhere it says the Old Testament on there as well. Right down here it says it's printed in 1631. And when it was printed, the king got the th thousand Bibles. Thank you. You can, and, uh, you can uh, turn on the lights again if you want to. That's the title page. Thousand copies. But a critical om omission, a very serious omission. What's that mean? Something was left out in this Bible. And it infuriated King Charles I because he was a very much of a religious leader of, of his time. And the Archbishop of Canterbury, uh, Canterbury, the, the Archbishop of Canterbury. Canterbury is another town in England. And uh, the Archbishop of the whole Episcopal Church of England lives there. Lyndon took me there. And we went into the cathedral. And... Um, they were having a funeral or something. Is that right, darling? So we couldn't really... We, but, but there was a box of things, and it says, on sale. So, of course, I had to go see what was in that box. And it was the Canterbury hymn books. And I got one for like $4, and it was really a fun book to look at because you know what they were talking about in that hymn book? The change in music and how every generation has a different mode or form of music and their biggest concern however was that the lyrics be scriptural and I enjoyed that and that's what we really need to be looking at as well in our in our songs is is it scriptural so anyway that was King Charles and the Archbishop of Canterbury recalled all of those thousand Bibles and burned all of them but there were ten that somebody didn't turn in. And you can see one of them in the uh, library in New York City. So anyway, all but 10 were destroyed, and here's the omission. And you'll see that on your newsletter. They're here they gave the Ten Commandments, and it says, Thou shalt what? Amen. Commit adultery. And so here is a command within the commandments. And what they think is that the, the printer's uh, um, competition in the printing business got involved in this printing of, this ten, of these thousand copies and left out this. And the man that printed this, his company, was fined several, several, what we would say thousands of dollars today by the king. And he eventually went out of business and died a pauper. Because this is a pretty serious omission, isn't it? So every word in the Bible is very important. And the reason I'm just showing you this is because we like history in here, don't we? Yes, sir? That was what Satan did to Eve. He misquoted God's word. He did, didn't he? In fact, he left out the word not, come to think, when he misquoted God's word. He told Eve, is this really what God said that you will not to eat of this tree? And then he said, Eve, you shall not surely die. Woo. So leaving out that word is very, very critical to the understanding of God's word. What, honey? Is that what you wanted me to, is that what you were saying? Okay. All right. So, one copy is in the collection of rare books in the New York Public Library, and we didn't know it, so we didn't see it, did we? All right, you have to ask for it. And here is the cop, what it looks like today. And another one, there are a thousand, I mean, uh, ten copies in the world that we know of that are left. One of them went up for public auction, and they priced it at $99,500. So, that, it's available for you if you want it. 
Oh, that was the video I was going to watch. Okay. Um, the scrolls in the, in, the, in the Bible, when you talk about a scroll, it represents the Word of God. So I want us to look at Ezekiel. You say to me, well, I thought we were reading Zechariah. Well, we are, but we're going to go back to Ezekiel because Ezekiel had a vision as well, and it was a vision of a scroll. So look at chapter um, 2 of Ezekiel. Ezekiel and then Daniel. And we're going to go back to Daniel someday too, I promise you, Rhonda, I promise. And so when we read Ezekiel, and I want to show you something here. Look how I wrote the reference to Ezekiel. It's Ezekiel 2, 8 through 3, 4. What does that mean? Ezekiel 2, 8 through 3, 4. Who? What, Martha? That's exactly right. Thank you. Did y'all hear what she said? No. It's chapter 2, verse 8. We're going to read all of that through chapter 3, verse 4. It's really important that we understand that as well. I have put it on the, over on the PowerPoint but I would really like for you to read it from your Bible with me because if you don't, unless you don't have one, because it would really help you understand it better. This is the call of Ezekiel. He was a, considered a major prophet, so therefore his book is what? Large. Very big, very big. He was a, an exilic prophet. What? An exilic prophet. What does that mean? He wrote it when he was in exile in Babylon. So we have the pre-exile prophets, the exilic prophets, and then the three prophets who prophesied after the exile, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. So he was in Babylon as a slave when he received this vision. The people went into exile in Babylon because they refused to hear the word of God. They refused to hear the prophets and to follow God's commandments. They refused. Purposely, they refused. And so we think, okay, God has had their city destroyed by Babylon. Their temple has been razed to the ground. All of their wealth has been plundered. And they're taking, taken as slaves to Babylon. Surely now, surely they will hear the word of God now. Wouldn't you think? But I want to read to you what God tells Ezekiel as he calls him to prophesy to the people in exile. Let's look at chapter 2. And I'm going to start a little bit at verse, let's start at verse 3. And this is verse 8. So I'm going to read a little bit because I want you to see the context of the book of Ezekiel. Son of man, I am sending you to the Israelites. Where are the Israelites? Babylon. Babylon. Where is Ezekiel? Babylon. Babylon. I'm sending you to them. To a rebellious nation that has rebelled against me. They and their fathers have been in revolt against me to this very day. Wouldn't you hate it for God to say that about us? Th Tiffany's here. Hi, darling. Can I tell the good news? This is Tiffany. Raise your hand, Tiff. She's married to Gary, and she's having a baby. She's going to have a baby. We're going to get another baby in this family. We always love new babies. <laughs> Linda and I always loved new babies when we were young because it gave us a sense of job security. <laughs> we were both teachers. We're so happy for you. How many babies is this now? Uh, this is number six. <laughs> Isn't that great? Number six. Number six. Oh, I think that it gives me goosebumps. That is so cool. Okay, where was I? Um. Thank you. <laughs> Was that chasing a rabbit, Lyndon? Yeah. Not really. 
verse 4 of Ezekiel. The people are revolting against God to that very day. The people, verse 4, to whom I am sending you are obstinate and stubborn. You see how God is describing his people? Even in the midst of slavery and exile, they're still obstinate. They're still stubborn. Say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. And then he says, verse 5, And whether they listen or fail to listen, for they are a rebellious house, they will know that a prophet has been among them. Do you know how you know if a person is speaking literally the word of God? How do you know? You have studied the word of God. You've studied it. You've studied it. That's true. You've studied it and you know whether I, what I am saying is true. That's how we're going to know. And you know that you have a person of God among you who speaks the word of God. So let's look on. He says, whether, whether they listen or not, they will know that you are a prophet that's been among them. And you, son of man, do not be afraid of them or their words. Do not be afraid. Though briars and thorns are all around you and you live among scorpions. Do not be afraid of what they say or terrified by them. That's four times now he said that, isn't it? Don't be afraid. Though they are a rebellious house, you must speak my words to them, whether they listen or fail to listen, for they are rebellious. But you, son of man, now this is what's on the overhead, you, son of man, listen to what I say to you. Do not rebel like that rebellious house. Open your mouth and eat what I give you. He told Jeremiah, eat my words. Now he's telling Ezekiel, open your mouth and I'm going to give you to eat. Let's see what it is. Then, verse 9, Then I looked and I saw a hand stretched out to me. And in that hand was a what? A scroll. scroll. And every time we read about the scroll, we read about the word of God. I saw a hand stretched out to me. In it was a scroll. And he unrolled it before me. On both sides of the scroll were written words of lament and mourning and woe. Ooh. Wow. Listen. The word of God, if we do not listen to it and follow it, if we are obstinate and stubborn and want to go our own ways, the words of God will be words of lament and mourning and woe. Is there another side to this, we hope? Let's read on. And he said to me in verse... Chapter 3. Now we're in chapter 3. Son of man, eat what is before you. Eat this scroll. Then go and speak to the house of Israel. So I opened my mouth and he gave me the scroll to eat. Now this is taken literally, I suppose. But for you and for me, we are to meditate upon the Word of God day and night. We are to read it and absorb it as if we were eating it because it is power unto us. It is our strength. It is our substance. It is our nourishment for our, for our spiritual life. And if we don't eat it, then our lives will not be anything but lamentable full of mourning, full of woe. Let's read on. Verse 3. Then he said to me, Son of man, eat this scroll I am giving you and fill your stomach with it. So I ate it and it tasted as sweet as honey in my mouth. Verse 4. Wait. 
He did what God said to him. So the words were not lamentable. They were not full of mourning. They were not full of woe. These words were what? Sweet as honey. You see, the word of God, depending upon our minds, will either be like a bitter pill or it will be sweet as honey. Now, who gets to determine how God's words taste? We do. We do. We do. Depending upon our willingness to hear it and believe it and follow it. It will be sweet as honey or it will be a bitter pill. And bitterness, bitterness is a terrible taste, isn't it? Bitterness is awful because it controls our whole lives. And we're going to find that bitterness and anger and jealousy, all of that puts us in a bondage like we can never believe. And only the Word of God can relieve us from that. So when he ate it, it tasted as sweet as honey in his mouth. Verse 4. Now remember, what's he reading and eating? A scroll. A scroll, which represents what? The Word of God. The Word of God. Verse 4, he then said to me, Son of man, go now to the house of Israel and speak what? My My words to them. Where is Clifford? (sighs) Today, today is Clifford's birthday. So I want you to give Virginia today a real big hug. Emma, give your little sister a hug there. Because I miss Clifford. I do too. He, give her a hug, Kathy. Because whenever I dropped anything, sometimes I'd drop them on purpose just to see if Clifford was paying attention. (laughs) And he'd be up here picking my stuff up. I love that man. We miss him. You were such a good wife to him, Virginia. He loved you. He cared for you. He He taught me how to fish. I didn't like it, but he did. (laughs) Okay, I chased another rabbit. What? He didn't care whether you liked it or not. No, he didn't, did he? He cleaned my fish for me, though. Why did I read to you, Ezekiel? What? What? It is very similar to Zechariah, isn't it? Because we're going to read Zechariah. You don't know that yet. Timothy? Is that in the book of Revelation too, Timothy? Revelation. What? Revelation 10. Revelation 10. Thank you. Appreciate that. All right, let's move on here. That doesn't mean literally. No, it doesn't mean to literally. Where is the battlefield? Where is our battlefield in our lives? In the mind. Satan, that's where he attacks us, isn't it? He attacks us in our mind. God says, eat the word. Put it on in your mind. And, and that way, put on, the full whole armor of God is a mental thing. And we are to put on that, all that armor in our mind and protect our minds from the assaults of the, of the devil. And so he was telling him, though, to eat it. And um, I don't know if it's literal or not. I'm going to just say it is, but it could be. Very good, Kathy, with the bread and the wine. All right. Oh, wait, let's go back to that one. Depending on how the people received the words, right? The words of God would be as a what? Bitter pill pill or taste like Sweet sweet honey. I really, really do hope that every day you spend a few minutes eating the sweet honey of God's word. And asking God to impress upon you his truths. Now, then let's go to Zechariah chapter 5. Zechariah was a prophet just like Ezekiel. Zechariah was a minor prophet. Meaning what? A smaller book than it was Ezekiel and Jeremiah. Listen carefully. He was a post-exilic prophet. What does that mean? 
He was after the exile. He was in Judah, when the people returned, as the people returned home, he probably came in with them back from Babylon. And he and Haggai were called the temple prophets because they were encouraging the people to build their temple. So let's go now to Ezekiel chapter 5. No, I'm sorry. Zechariah, Zechariah chapter 5. This is one of the visions of Zechariah. And uh, I think there are two more. He had eight night visions, and this is his, whichever one it is. And um, let's read it, chapter 5, verses 1 through 4. Again, I have it up here, but I hope you read it from your Bible. Chapter 5. Okay. No? Yeah, that's it. <laughs> I looked again... And there before me was a what? Flying a flying scroll. And the angel asked me, what do you see? And I answered, I see a flying scroll, 30 feet long and 15 feet wide. Now, we're going to learn that when we studied the holy place, with the holy place and the most holy place, guess how long it was? 30 feet by 15 feet. I don't know if that's significant, but it's kind of good, isn't it? And he said to me, he said to me, this is the curse that is going out over the whole land. And when he speaks of land here, it could be of the whole earth or of the land of Israel. Uh, probably both. And for according, but, but initially to Israel, all right? Initially to Israel, but eventually we're going to see that a curse goes out over the whole earth. And we're going to find out why. For according to what the scroll says, on one side, every thief will be banished. So you want to underline the word thief. Because we're finding that every thief will be banished. And according to what it says on the other side, the, everyone who swears falsely will be banished. So he's speaking of two different things here. Every what? Thief. And every one who swears falsely. Which could be lying, yes. But it's, this is going to be important. It's one who swears falsely. And we find in the scriptures that G God says, you will not take my name in vain. in vain. That, we all think about it being swearing and cussing. But the real meaning here is that we do not swear by God's name falsely. I swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help me God. All right? That's a command, isn't it? Because you're swearing in the name of God. And I hear people all the time using that. And men, we better be really careful when we do that. Because we better be telling the truth if I swear on my mother's grave. All right? What's that mean? Using my mother as my basis of truth. When we swear by God's name, his name is holy, it is sovereign, he is omnipotent. And if we use that name to swear by, you don't do it falsely. That's what he's saying here. Now, look what happens if what the curse is. Verse 4. Oh, there's the scroll. Okay. The Lord Almighty declares... I will send it. Now you take the word it and you go back to the previous verse until you find the, the um, pronoun and it's the curse. All right? So he says, I will send it, the curse, out. And it will enter the house of whom? The thief. The thief. And the curse 
will enter the house of anyone who does what? Swears, Swears falsely by my what? Name. The Jews are so careful. They never even say the name of God. It is so holy. So you don't want to swear falsely by that name. Now, if it, what's it? The curse will remain in that house and destroy it. No, I'm sorry, I said if, didn't I? It, the curse, will remain in that house and will do what? Destroy it completely, both its timbers and its stones. The timbers, the structure of the house, the skeleton of the house. What did you call it when we built our house? The frame. The frame of the house, even to the skin, the stone, will be destroyed. That's the curse. All the way down. So let's see exactly what this means. Let's look at page 71 at our notes. All right. So let's re fill in the blanks on page 71. Ready? In the red. Those are the, those, that's the scripture. Caden, do you have your pencil? You ready to fill in the blanks on the pencil? Do you all know Caden and uh, Aaron? Brian. Brian? They've been here two weeks in a row. You know what that means, don't you? <laughs> They're almost ours. And they're the ones that passed out the papers today. And we appreciate that, guys. And, um, and we're glad you're a part of our class. Here we go. Zechariah chapter 5, verses 1 through 4. I looked again, and there before me was a what? Blind scroll. He asked me, who is he? The angel. Who's me? Zechariah. Zechariah. So the angel asked Zechariah, what do you see? I answered, who's I? All right. I answered, I see a flying scroll. What's the next one? How big was it? 30 feet long and 15 feet wide. And he said to me, this is the what? Now, a curse is judgment. Listen, when Jesus said, don't judge each other, he's talking about the penalty or the curse that comes upon a person for doing something. We don't judge. Who is the judge? God. God. He's the one who determines the penalty. <laughs> we can determine whether something is right or wrong, can't we? Mm. But we don't tell anybody the penalty for that. That's up to God. So he says the curse or the judgment that is going out over the whole land for according to what it says on one side, every thief will be banished. And according to what it says on the other, everyone who swears falsely will be banished. The Lord Almighty declares, I will send it out. Send what out? No, the curse. I will send out the curse. And it will enter the house of what? The thief. And the curse will enter the house of anyone who does what? Swears falsely by my name. It, that curse, will remain in that house and destroy it completely. Both its timbers and its stones. Now it says it will remain in that house. Uh, generally, the house will refer to the land of Israel, to Israel, okay? It can also refer to an individual's house. So we can say here that in Israel, if someone is a thief or if someone takes God's name falsely, uh, that curse will enter their house and destroy it. It's quite frightening, isn't it? Yes? Now then, let's look. Pardon me? You better pay attention. Better pay attention. Background. How big was the flying scroll? 
30 feet by 15 feet. That's number one on background. The scroll was approximately 30 feet by 15 feet, about the same size of what? Yeah, it would be 450 square feet, but I wanted you to write in here the holy place of the tabernacle. <laughs> but yeah, that's, oh, that's a question here. <laughs> it was about, um, we can compare it to the holy place of the tabernacle. Now, this is a picture I showed you a couple of weeks ago talking about the um, uh, menorah, but this is the tabernacle, and here is the altar, and here is where they wash the brazen uh, um, bowl and then here want to get the lights back there guys so you can see this and here we see the holy place this is the holy place and then a curtain divides the holy place from the most holy place where they have the ark it is in the holy place where we see the table of showbread we see the menorah and the incense this is 30 feet by 15 feet same size. I just thought that was kind of interesting. Wow. Kathy? Teacher, what is the scroll containing the blank of blank? Is that the word of God or the curse of God? What number are we on? A. 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 Ezekiel 2, 7, 4, 4. The scroll contains. Word of God. Uh, the word of God, but I have a different worksheet than y'all do. Okay. How'd that happen? Okay. Yes. D did I have Ezekiel on your worksheet? Oh, I did, didn't I? I just didn't get myself a new sheet. Somebody want to bring me a new sheet up here? Okay. Now, Exodus 20. We're going to go back to Exodus 20. Thank you. Because Exodus 20 is, thank you, the Ten Commandments. And we all know the Ten Commandments. How many of you could list the Ten Commandments? I try to do it every once in a while. How many of you have the Ten Commandments? A monument on your front porch or in your garden. Okay, have you read them right recently? <laughs> We're going to read those. Look at Exodus 20, chapter verses 1 through 11. It's the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments, by the way, God wrote the Ten Commandments Himself on the on the stone. How did He do that? With what? His finger. That's right. Now, of course, that's a figure of speech because God doesn't really have a finger, but, but that's, how he, that's how the scriptures want us to know that, the God, that God actually wrote this, imprinted it on the Ten Commandments. Is that the Hebrew side or the English side? Okay. So, I'm going to go to Exodus 20 and the Ten Commandments, and here they are. Okay? Are you there? Chapter 20 of Exodus. Is Exodus a prophetic book or a history book? It's a history book. So when you read it, don't read it as prophecy. It's history. Don't read it as, as uh, poetry unless some actual poetry in there. There is. But it's a history book. And here are the Ten Commandments. Here's how you're going to remember them. Commandments 1 through 4 represent our relationship to God. What did I just say? Commandments 1 through 4 represent what? Our relationship to God. Re uh, commandments 6, I mean 5 through 10, that's 6 of them, represent man's relationship with other men. Man meaning humankind. So, 6 through 10 represents our relationship to other people. And you'll see how that works in just a moment. Let's fill these out. Exodus 20, the Roman numeral, I mean letter number 2, represents what? Ten the Ten Commandments. That's right. Verse 1. Now, I'm going to read these to you. Oh, by the way, when God wrote these, I don't know if this is true or not, but this is how they have them. 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10. We are specifically interested in, in the middle commandment on this side and the middle commandment on the other side. So looking at this side of the commandments, what is the middle one? It's on your paper as well. What's this middle commandment? 
Thou shalt not do what? Take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Which one is that that I just told you from, Ezekiel, from Zechariah? Do not use God's name falsely. Don't take it in vain. Look at the middle commandment on the other side. Commandment 8. What is it? Thou shalt not steal. So God, I believe, has taken the middle commandments of each side of the tablets and emphasize those to represent all of them. Okay? Uh, and we'll see that in just a moment. The first four commandments. And I think we just need to read this because we haven't read these in a long time, have we? How many of you have read the Ten Commandments recently? Oh, good. Here we go. And God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of what? Slavery. Slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. That's the first commandment. You can fill them in as you want to. And, and the second one is verse 4. You shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything. Now, do you hear that? Don't make idols in the form of anything and worship it. Don't make idols in the form of anything in heaven, stars in the moon, or on the earth, anything. Don't make an image. And the earth beneath it or in the waters. Now, when you get into the Old Testament, you'll see God's galore, the God of I uh, forgot its name, but a huge fish. And, and all kinds of gods that just represented everything on earth. And he said, don't do it. Verse 5, you don't bow down to these images. You don't worship them. Why? For I, the Lord your God, am a, what kind of God? Jealous, Jealous God. I will punish the children for the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. But I will show love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. So one is you shall have what? No other gods. No other gods. Commandment two, you shall not make for yourself an image, nor shall you do what? Worship it. So that's number Three, letter A and B. B is you shall not make nor worship images of any kind. Now let's look at verse 7. This is the third commandment. No. Yes. Verse 7. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. For the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Don't do it. Don't do it. Now let me to give you some comfort here. The New Testament says we can fulfill all of these commandments if we love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, strength, and mind. You will never take God's name in vain if you love him with all of your heart, your soul, your strength, and your mind. You will not worship anything else if you love God with all your heart your soul your strength and your mind you will have no other God would you because he said all of these commandments are fulfilled in love and here's the fourth one remember the Sabbath day by keeping it what holy, holy. and here is how he told the Israelites to keep that day holy now it's one command by the time Jesus was alive, there were 430 rules to keep this day holy. I'm that, I, may have, I may have exaggerated that number, but there were hundreds. Hundreds of rules to help them not break this, this um, commandment, to keep it holy. But here's what God said. Six days you shall... What verse am I on? Thank you. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. 
But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On that day, you shall not do any work. Isn't that great? Mm -hmm. Neither you nor your son or your daughter nor your manservant or your maidservant nor your animals nor the alien within your gates. Verse 11. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them. But he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Uh, I got a book just the other day from the Seventh Day Adventist right in my mail. It scared me to death because they know how to write books and scare you to death. But you see, the scriptures are clear in the New Testament that we fulfill each one of these through love. All right, we are not under these commandments specifically on this right here. We are under the commandments of love. We walk by the Spirit, which they couldn't do in the Old Testament. And it's by the Spirit, walking by the Spirit, that we keep God's commands. It says we are not under any special day or any special moon or any special festival. That's not what does, that's not what controls us. It is God's spirit within us that helps us live according to his commands. So when you get your Seventh Day Adventist book, read it because it's really cool. And ask God to give you peace about it because they're going to come at you. All right? They're going to say, you're going to hell. They will. They will say, you're going to hell if you do not keep the Seventh Day. The New Testament says we are not under obligation to any day to any festival, to any month. We are obligated to the Spirit of God. Yes, ma'am? Because God rested at one day, don't you think we should rest one day? I think we ought to rest as many days as we can. <laughs> I'm going to take that day on Friday. <laughs> You're going to take that day as Friday. I'm, no, I'm going to, I've got witnesses that you said that. <laughs> okay. He's going to take that day Oh, write it down. Okay. You may, darling, because I'm taking today off. Yes, sir. Yeah, in Hebrews chapter 3 and chapter 4, it really answers that question because it says they did not, the Old Testament uh, people did not enter into God's rest because of their unbelief and because of their rebellion. But we are to enter into his rest every single day. So every single day is a rest of God or the kingdom of God. So... We're talking here about Hebrews, which talks about the rest of God for us as believers today. And that's entering into his spirit, into him by faith. Isn't that wonderful? And today, every day is holy. Every day is holy. And we are to rest in the Lord. Jesus said, just cast all your burdens on me. I'll carry them for you. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe in me. Isn't that wonderful? All right, so that's what that one says. So number four on your paper is you shall not misuse what? Oh, we're not there yet. Yeah. What's the third commandment? The name of God. You shall not misuse the name of God. Don't you swear by it falsely. And verse four, you shall keep what? The Sabbath day holy. These are the four commandments relating to Israel's relationship with whom? God. God. So, he is their only God. They are to have no graven images. They are not to worship any other graven image. And they are to keep the Sabbath day holy. Now let's read the um, next six commandments which they are related to man's relationship with other men, people. All right. Do we have everything ready for number three? Have we done it? Mm -hmm. Okay. You have all four commandments related to God. Yes. Okay. So that's how you're going to remember it. The first four commandments are related to God. Now then, verse number four, the next six commandments are related to our relationship with other people. Number Five, very important one. We need to treat, teach our children most gently that we are, they are to honor their mother and their father. Such an important commandment. Verse uh, Number six, verse 13. You shall not what? Murder. Murder. 
Verse 7, or 14, number 7. You shall not what? Commit adultery, Commit adultery unless you're reading which Bible? The wicked Bible. The wicked Bible. <laughs> number 8, verse 15. You shall not what? Steal. 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 Uh, number 9, Steal. verse 16. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. Who's our neighbor? Jesus said anybody, right? Anybody who's in need. And number 10, you shall not covet your neighbor's house. Okay. Maybe their patio, Dorothy, but not my house. <laughs> okay. You want my patio. Okay. <laughs> she wants my patio, not my house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife. You think that's so simple, but I guess it's not. Or you will not covet his servants, his cars, or anything. Fishing rods, motorcycles, clothes, dishes, dishes, lawn. All right, the lawn. You don't covet anything that belongs to your neighbor. Now, uh, I didn't look up the word covet, but when I was a little girl, my dad said covet, and I don't know if this is right. You need to look that up. My dad says covet means to want something that somebody else has and you don't want them to have it. So if you want somebody else's yard, you want their yard and they can't have it. I'm not sure that's what that means, though. I forgot to look it up. Yes, sir? Timothy? Uh, yes, covet means a yearn to possess or have something. A yearn to possess or have something. Okay. What? Don't keep up with the Joneses. Keeping up with the Joneses. Thank you, John. All right, so now let's fill in the blanks. The next six commandments have to do with our relationship with others. Number, letter A, number five, honor whom? Your mother and your father. What if your mother and your father don't teach you the right things? What does that mean to honor your father and your mother when they really don't deserve it? Yes, Stephanie, help me out here. Don't talk about them. Okay? All right? Because they are your father and your mother. They gave you birth. All right? Anything else? Thank you, Steph. To regard them because they gave you birth, if nothing else, and you respect them. You don't speak about them, nor do you speak disrespectfully to them. Yes. Oh, Lavanda. I'm sorry now? They're not, maybe not honorable, but we do honor them. And that's really hard sometimes. Yes, ma'am? And when they do unhonorable things, you forgive them. And we forgive. Whoa. It's also for, their, for our benefit because if we stay angry, we're bitter. So we don't stay angry because that's bitterness which really causes inner turmoil. So we forgive them. Okay? I think you forgive their position as you. I'm sorry? You honor them for the position of your parents, but not honor what they do. The of course. We honor them because of their position. That's right. And we pray for them. Don't forget to pray for your parents, even if they are honorable. Our parents need our prayers. Okay. Number six, letter B. You shall not what? Murder. Murder. Number seven, you shall not commit adultery. adultery. Jesus said you even look at a person with lust and you've committed adultery. Number eight, you shall not what? Steal. 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 Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Number nine, you shall not what? Yes. Give false testimony against your neighbor. So don't be gossiping. Don't be repeating things you've heard unless, well, just don't. And um, 
unless they tell you to. So um, that's giving false testimony. And uh, in the court of law, of course. Verse 17, number 10, you shall not what? Covet. Covet anything that belongs to your neighbor. Now then, I want to show you something very quickly. I think it's time to quit though, is it? <laughs> um, letter B. The Ten Commandments were written with the finger of God. And I was going to show you YouTube, but I forgot. Go back to the flying scroll. Look at the left tablet. What's the middle commandment? You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. That's the middle commandment. And it represents all four commandments relating to our relationship with God. Okay? So we're to follow all of them, but instead of writing all of them, they put this one on there to, to represent the four commandments of God, relating to God. The middle commandment is, what's, thou shalt not take the name of your Lord in vain. How does it relate to the flying scroll? He says, everyone who swears falsely will be banished. This command represents all four commandments related to our relationship with God. So therefore we are to follow the four commandments that have to do with God. So look at page 71, at the, close to the bottom. B1, you shall not take what? The name. the name of the Lord your God in vain. This represents all four commandments dealing with man's relationship with God. Now then let's quickly look at the other side and then we will finish, we will study what, what, about the curse next week. We are to look at the right tablet and look at the middle commandment and what is it? <laughs> Thou shalt not steal. How does this relate to the flying scroll? God says every thief will be what? Banished. Banished. It represents, this, third, this commandment, the middle commandment on this side, represents all six commandments dealing with our relationship with others. We don't steal, we don't covet, we don't kill, we don't um, bear false testimony, we honor our parents. This, that is, we are to follow the six commandments that have to do with our fellow man. Jesus was asked, which is the greatest of these commandments? Which is the greatest of the four? And which is the greatest of the six? So let's take the four. Jesus, they said, what is the greatest of these four commandments dealing with our relationship to God? Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. That's not even on there, is it? It's out of Deuteronomy. And then they said, well, what's the greatest commandment? Dealing with our relationship with man. And Jesus said, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And then he gave a wonderful, wonderful concluding statement. Against these, to love God with all your heart and to love your fellow man as you love yourself, there's no law against any of that. Isn't that wonderful? Jesus could put it into two commands. And it all hinges on what? A four-letter word. Love. It all hinges on love. So this week, we need to practice these commandments. And the way we do it is to love God and His Word with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our strength and all of our mind, and we are to love our neighbors as ourselves. If we do, we'll go over to them, Jamel, and ask them how they have such a beautiful yard. <laughs> and you can come sit on my patio anytime, any of you. Because we are going to love one another. Jesus even gave us a greater command. He said, I'm going to give you a new command. After he'd said all that, he said to his disciples, I'm going to give you a new commandment. What was it? Love one another 
as much as I have loved you. So he tells us, as believers, we love our neighbors, as anybody, as much as we love ourselves. That's unbelievers, okay? But then when you look, listen up, when you look around this room at fellow believers, Jesus said the new commandment for you is that you are to love each other in here. In here. As much as I have loved you. As much as if you were willing to do what? To die for them. Because that's how much Jesus loved us. That's how much we love one another in this room. And so next week we're going to read about the curse. And we'll go through it really quickly because we will not live under that. You just need to know what happens to people who are arrogant and unbelievers and stubborn and obstinate. We're not. Let's pray. Oh, you want to come pray? Um, I can. Will you have a question? Well, I was going to ask about letter D. Letter D. That's the judgment. That's the curse. We'll do it next week. And furthermore, next week, we are going to uh, start uh, the woman in the basket. That's a fun one. There's this woman in this basket, and she's trying to get out, so there's this big iron lid that they keep pressing down on her, and she keeps trying to get out. And then these two women with wings come and pick up that basket and fly it away. Okay. <laughs> Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word and how you instruct us to live and to walk with you, Lord. Father, help us to take Ezekiel to heart, Lord. We are in a generation that is rebelling against you, Lord, and that we need to minister to them and witness to them, Lord, whether they listen or not. Mm -hmm. Plant the seed in individuals that need to know you, Lord, and you will water it from there, Lord. Mm -hmm. Help us to do our responsibility so therefore you can do yours, Lord. Father, we just thank you for the week to come, and we thank you for the blessings that you are going to deliver to us and help us to bless you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. And thank you for letting me be your teacher.